Uh, today we're going to look at difficult people and how to handle difficult people. And, uh, and so, you know, if I share this message and you're like, man, I don't know anybody like that, then you may be the difficult person. That's why. So, uh, and then my, my second thing you need to know is that if that difficult person or an attribute of a difficult person is with you in church today, do not poke them and say, this is good. You should write that down. Like, don't, don't do that. Don't forward this message to your difficult person like this should really help you. Like there's just several things that could go really wrong with this message. Uh, so I just need y'all to be careful with it and, and just use it as something that to really help all of us. And, but, but we have difficult people in our life. They're the, the crazy makers. They're the ones, they're the people that when you interact with them, you walk away and just talk to yourself. Like I don't understand why I even know them. I don't understand why I, 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 why I don't even know why I try. It's those people that I want to talk about today and how we deal with them. And so what we do know in Scripture is Jesus always gave us this principle. He said, before you can deal with somebody else, he goes, you've always got to deal with you first. Jesus did it as he said, there's, if there's a plank in your eye, if you're going to take out the speck in theirs, you've got to deal with the plank in yours. And I think that's really important when we deal with people is that we, under, we have to first Look at ourselves and say, what did I do? What am I doing? How am I contributing to this? And then we have the space and the right attitude to go deal with the difficult people in our life. So I, I created a couple things, a couple sentences that I'm hoping are somewhat kind of like a mirror for you to help you look at yourself before you look at the other person. And the first mirror is this. The relationships you have are a combination of what you've created and what you've allowed. And so the relationships in your life right now, all, mostly all of them, there are probably some that do not fit that, that, that statement, are, are, are what you've allowed to happen in that relationship and what you've created in that relationship. So that means that, that you're part of what's going on in that relationship, but that doesn't mean that it always has to stay the same, that I believe God has given you the power to change some of these things in your life. So with that in mind, that all relationships are a combination of what you've created and what you allowed, it brings me to my second mirror, which is this. If you don't want, you like what you have, change what you expect and what you accept. Change what you expect and change what you accept. Now, last week I talked to you a little bit with stress about expectations, that sometimes we have too high of expectations from people. You know, I was talking to a couple one time, and, and she just really wished her husband had psychic abilities, basically, that he just knew intuitively what she needed that day. And I was like, how long y'all been married? They're like, oh, about 10 years. I said, he hadn't figured it out. She's like, no. And I'm like, honey, he ain't. Like, it's just, it ain't going to happen. Like, you got to open your mouth and say, baby, you know what would mean a lot to me is if you did this. And, I, and I, the husband's like, yeah, that'd be awesome. Like, I, I don't even know what's happening. Like, you know, he's just like deer in the headlights. Like, I didn't know. I, I'm, I'm trying, you know. And, and so I said, listen, I know it'd be great if your husband had that ability, but he doesn't. And you married him. So you, what you need to do is communicate to him what your hopes and expectations are so that he can meet you there. And sometimes our relational stuff is as simple as changing our expectations. And then also it's this. It's, it's what you accept. Some of us have let people keep pushing over a boundary in our heart and in our life in a way that's created an unhealthy balance in our life, an unhealthy place in that relationship. And some of us need to probably move the line a little bit and no longer accept certain things in our life, accept people to communicate to you in a certain way. And those two things, that kind of simple mirror helps change how we deal with relationships because we're going to have difficult people. And we ourselves at times are going to be those difficult people. And there's two reasons why. Number one, we live in a fallen world. Uh, and and that's, that's one reason that, that nobody is capable of being perfect except Jesus. And even Jesus in all of his perfection had Judas that betrayed him. So that means that you can do the very best that you possibly can. And there's still going to be difficult people in your life. There, there's no way around it. The other thing you have to understand is especially when it comes to family in the church, is that the enemy hates good relationships. Ephesians describes our relationship with one another as a church body as giving life to one another. I know we like to think of ourselves some sort of spiritual cowboy that just kind of rides into the sunset by ourselves, but Scripture says that is not the case, that we are all linked in giving life to one another. And so what the enemy loves to do is sow discord, sow disunity, sow strife, sow contention, so that life flow that God created for us begins to stop. 
And so I want to talk about um, uh, basically four groups of difficult people. Now I've grouped them in the groups. That's why they're in groups today. And, and so that means there may not be people in the group that I'm going to group them in. But that does not mean that group may not exist. I'm just doing four groups. Is that clear? So you may, you may have the white rhino of relationships. Like, Eddie, you got four of them, but he's got, there's four more groups out there. You totally missed, bro. You don't know this dude. You should come to my family's Thanksgiving. It is amazing. Like, it's a therapist's dream. Like, you know, like, therapist looks at it's like, wow, I could do so much work here. You know, like, so I, I get that. So these are going to be some generalizations uh, of, of groups. And, and so the first group I want to talk about are what I call the controller um, they're the guys, they're the people, they're the men, they're the women, they're the whatever in your life that say, God loves you and I have a wonderful plan for your life. Like they're the ones that want to come in and really just use certain emotional tools to control you. Typically they use guilt, a big one. Uh, they, they guilt you into doing things. You, you're like, oh, I got to do it because I don't feel so, you know, they said this and I feel so guilty. Uh, some of them uh, use threats. Emotional threats, like well, that's it, you know, um, that's it. We're all, you know, you know, and, and and they just do that to elicit a response out of you, so that you step back and you kind of cater to whatever they want because they're, and that's not a healthy way to have a relationship, right? Like I threatened Julie, I'm going to Sonic if you don't cook dinner right now, and and she and I went to Sonic, so that didn't work. So, um, you know, uh, and, and then sometimes there's the ones, the most deadly of them all, the silent controller. They just stop talking, you know, like Houston shuts down and you're just like, hello, Houston, you know, and then then they use silence, you know. Um, I remember when we first got married and where Julia are learning how to communicate, uh, apparently I I upset her, which is, I don't know how that ever happened, like, (laughs) you know, and so I said, you know, babe, are you okay? She said, I'm fine. And I was like, oh, awesome, good. I thought we had a problem, but I guess not. So, and then I ended up leaving and then I I came home. Y'all, she wasn't fine. Like, I just... (laughs) I was like, that ain't fine. I know what fine is. Now, you are fine, girl, but that ain't fine, right? Like, that, you know. So if you're newlywed and they say they're fine, they're not. They're lying. God forgives them. You should too. So, um, so, so sometimes silence. And uh, so when we look at this, you have to understand their goal as a controller is to force you to act and behave a certain way. And so we, we see in the, in the Gospels, Peter actually tried to do this with Jesus and it's Matthew 16, 22. Peter took him aside. This is Jesus after he's telling them everything he's about to go through on the cross. And, and, he, and Peter took him aside and rebuked him and said, never, Lord. He said, this will never happen to you. And then Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And this lays something out that for the controller is that, that every controller wants someone who will allow it. And for Peter, if, if Jesus would have listened to Peter at that moment, we would not be sitting here today. And so Jesus pushed back. Now, now what that, that means, like if you have a controlling mama or a controlling grandmother, grandmother, you cannot turn around and say, get behind me, Satan. Like you, That's not the advice I'm giving here today. But, but you need to recognize that sometimes controlling people are out there. And you have to deal with them and come up with a strategy for that. The second person is what I call the critical. Uh, they be, feel like they've been given the gift of fault finding, even though it's not a spiritual gift at all. Um, you, you, and, and you really, and I know that some personalities lean to more of a critical nature. Um, but, but just because you have a more critical nature does not mean that being critical is something that God has for you and God wants you to do in the life of your relationships. Now, the critical thing, the critical person, they typically come from a lot of different areas, but one of them is pride. They just think they know more than you, and they can do it better than you, and no, 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 and that's why they do it. Sometimes they do it from ignorance because they just don't know, and so they think you're doing it wrong, but they just don't know how to do it, you know, and so they, they're sitting there spouting off stuff that they have no idea about, and they'll be critical of you. Sometimes they do it from hurt. Because it's a, it's a protective mechanism that they just push people away with all their criticism. And, and what we have to understand is, is, is the critical person is obviously someone who, who, who really wants to dominate. They want to intimidate with their opinions. And that's how they control conversations and control things in your life. But we also have to understand that, that we, on the flip side of that, we also need to be open to, to godly criticism, to godly challenges in our life. 
But scripture says for that to take place, that that has to be spoken in love. That means that love is at the foundation of, of what that person is saying. When the critic says something, they do it to tear you down. They do it to create uh, intimidation. They're just showing that they're right. But, but scripture also says we need to have voices in our life that help challenge us. Listen to Romans 14.10. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you treat them with contempt? For we will stand before God's judgment seat. What a reminder. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Make up your mind. Notice he says, listen, it's, the ball's in your court. You don't have to be critical. He says, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of your brother or sister. What the, what the critical person does is typically they trip people up in their life. It, 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 it pushes people emotionally. It pushes people uh, in the relationally. They just don't know what's going on. And so we have to keep in mind, if we're a highly critical person, what you're literally doing, or, or we know a highly critical person, is they're putting roadblocks in front of everybody in their world. Now, the, the third one is what I call the complicated. Um, some call it needy. I didn't want to say needy because that hurt their feelings, so I said complicated. Um, and, and the needy person, they just never have enough. They never have enough time, never enough communication, never, 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 never. They have such high expectations, often nobody can meet them. Uh, they're the ones that kind of push, keep pushing and pushing and pushing, and you just, you're the, they're the ones you avoid uh, when, you know, you pretend your text message is broke when they text, like, oh, my phone only doesn't receive your text message. I don't know what's wrong. Like, Oh, I don't know, you know, like when the phone rings, you're like, oh, I wish America would blow up right now. So I don't think it's like you're just thinking like I wish something would happen horrible. So I don't think it's called that. That's probably a horrible illustration. If I had a third service, I would not use that again, just to let y'all know. Um, uh, so, you know, they're, 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 they're that person in our life. Uh, the, the fourth person is this. It's the, the offended. I call them the garbage collectors of the soul. Um, they, they don't let go of things. They, they take stuff in. And they keep magnifying it. Um, they, they see things the longer they live more kind of through this crooked lens because they absorb so much pain and so much uh, stuff in their life. They, they get offended, and then they just build things in their head. Um, sometimes they, you know, they, they choose to really turn that offense into gossip. They start talking bad about other people. It happens in churches. It happens in homes. It happens in business. And really, so often, you can find this offended person because they'll, when they're caught talking about somebody, they'll say this simple term, well, you misunderstood. In other words, what they're saying, you're calling me on what I'm saying, and I'm just going to say you misunderstood. Because though it looked like gossip, and it smelled like gossip, and it smelled like that, it isn't. It, 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 I don't know what it is, but it's just not that. And so we have to understand that that offended soul is carrying around something. And in Romans, it, it groups this offense, this gossip-type personality into a tough group of people. Uh, Romans 1.29, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips. And so many times when the offended person lets that offense keep going they, and fester, that really it, it hangs out with all the other sins that have to do with anger in our life. And so it makes room for this darkness in our life. I, I remember I, I have this friend and, and her, her, her mom, or his mom, uh, gossips to all the other adult children about each other. And so, like, she'll, if, you're, if one of the children are sitting with her, she'll say, oh, well, so-and-so's doing that. And then the other child will show up, and she'll call them and tell them. And when the children all get together, all of a sudden, there's all this tension in the room. And what's happened is the mom has become a gossip. Because regardless of where the gossip is, it's still gossip. If you gossip in a family setting, you may say, well, I was just telling them about, no, you were gossiping. And that gossip's going to bring ugliness into that family situation. So the offended typically do that. Now, if they, if they, you know, what we have to remember about this offended person and what we have to remember about the, if they're gossiping is that if they do it to somebody else, they'll do it to you. And I remember that's a hard lesson I learned as a teenager that I knew somebody who just talked about everybody. And so I thought I was safe until I found out I wasn't safe. And so that's a word of advice for anybody. If you have somebody who loves to talk trash about everybody else, you're on the menu when you're not around, most likely, right? And so listen to Proverbs 2019. This is in the message translation. Gossips can't keep secrets, so never confide in blabbermouths. I, I love that, confide in blabbermouths. I just, I don't know. I like the fact that 
I have a version of the Bible that says blabbermouth in it. So, um, because the, honestly, I've never met a happy, well-adjusted person that, that, that operates that way. There's something broken. There's something hurt. There's something that the enemy has used. And so when we, we talk about those kind of four groups of people, and we can probably bulk other traits like that in there, we really have a decision. And some of our initial responses of how to deal with this aren't good. Uh, typically, we want to reverse it. Like, we're going to turn it back on them. we just like, oh, they're going to say that, then I'm going to say this. Like, you know, oh, I, you, they said that about me. Well, let me tell you something about them. I mean, you just, you reverse it. You just, you just keep adding fuel to the fire. And, and you actually make the situation worse. Or sometimes we're tempted just to nurse it. We, we take it and we hold our pain, and it becomes like this trophy we wear around about how this person hurt us and what they said, and, and we become to identify with it, and it, we use it as an excuse of why we do the other things that we know aren't right is because that, that happened to us. Or the third thing we like to do is we like to rehearse it. We begin to turn around and tell other people about it. And if we do that, reverse it, nurse it, or rehearse it, all three of those things will make you a difficult person and will continue and push down the road what, what's going on in your life. So scripture says, listen, when you, when you run into difficult people, there's certain things I, I want you to do that are healthy for you, that spiritually bring healing into your life and bring wholeness in your life. So I want to talk about that for the rest of today. And let's look at this, 2 Timothy 2.23. Again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only starts fights. And you're like, well, if we do that, Eddie, what are we going to talk about at Thanksgiving? Like, you know, like, I thought that was funny. So, um, but it says, don't get involved. If you see it coming down the road, you hear the conversation turning, back out of it, Scripture says, because it only starts fights. And then he goes on, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to who? Everyone. Be able to teach and be patient with who? Difficult people. And so in Scripture, it says, listen, you're going to run across difficult people, and your option for that is to be kind and then also be patient with them. It's not that you're going to turn around and beat them over the head and say, well, you're a difficult person. No, no, no. No, he says, I want you to be patient with them. Verse 25, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change these people's hearts, and they'll learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap, for they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. Scripture teaches us that, that really our response is what's key. We can't pick how people treat us, but we can decide how we treat other people. And so the first thing we have to understand in dealing with difficult people is we have to decide who we're going to please. Are, are we going to please that person? Are we going to please even our own emotions? Or are we going to make a bigger decision to please God? And listen to this in John 5.30. By myself, I can do nothing. This is Jesus. By myself, I can do nothing. If Jesus could do nothing by himself, we definitely can do nothing by ourselves. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Jesus says, listen, I don't do any of this by myself. And in fact, I only say what I really hear the Father saying about this. And if the Father doesn't give me the okay to say it, and the Father doesn't give me the okay to do that, then I don't want to do it. He goes, I don't want to please myself. I just want to please the one who sent me. And so many times that we have to decide who to please because somebody says, well, Eddie, I just like to please everybody. I like to make everybody happy. But sometimes when you do that, it causes you to validate who God says you are. And sometimes it causes you to cross a line that you shouldn't cross. And at that point, when, when other people are making you do things and say things and be things that you know do not please God, pleasing people has turned almost into an idol in your life. And so you have to step away from that and say, listen, I've gotta, I only can please God with my life. That's, that is the goal. And sometimes we need to take an, an action and just say, I'm going to make a decision to please God and then let your feelings catch up with it. But for some of us in this room, when it comes to relationships, you decide who you're going to please, and it's like a line is drawn in the sand and say, I will not go past this any longer. That person can say what they want. They can do what they want, but I don't, number one, have to have them in my life. And if I do, this is the standard that I have. This is the line I'm not going to cross. 
I'm not going to make it about anger or fear. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to get some godly counsel if I need to. I'm going to have someone that I'm accountable to. I'm going to talk to somebody that I trust their judgment and just say, hey, this is this difficult person. What should I do? But definitely I'm going to draw a line. The second thing that I think Scripture would call for us to do is just to refuse to be drawn in. That many times these difficult people want you to get in the mud with them. They say, man, you know, if they're slinging it, they want you to sling back because it makes them feel better about what they're doing and what they're saying. Listen to what Jesus says. But Jesus didn't trust them, verse 24 of John 2, because he knew, about, he knew all about people. Jesus wasn't drug into the fray because he understood people. In fact, Matthew uh, 22 records where the Pharisees were trying to drag Jesus into something. And so they kept making accusation and asking questions and really just trying to rope him into something. And Jesus kind of like kept sidestepping and he just wouldn't go down the road that he wanted. And finally, Scripture says that they finally gave up and they went away because they couldn't basically trap him with his words, with their words. And what we have to understand is many times we can refuse to be drawn in. There's people in your life, they love the conflict. I mean, they're like the Picasso creating a masterpiece of conflict in their life, and they're always working on it. But if you step away and say, listen, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be a part of that. I'm not going to return. Every time they always get me riled up, I always say something I regret. Well, this time I'm keeping my mouth shut. When I was in high school, I had a friend whose mom was really good at this, at just stirring up contention and so, you know, he was trying to serve God. And so one day, his, you know, his mom would always say things, and he would respond, and it would just went downhill really quick. And so I remember talking to him, and, he, and we just prayed about it. And he said, well, I'm just not going to respond the way that she's talking to me. And so he began to respond softly and, and respectfully every time. And after about a month of that, his mom came back. She's like, you're not being any fun. Like, why aren't you fighting? You know, and, 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 and really, it just kind of it let the air and it took away the sting and took away the power of it. And, and you'll be amazed many times if you choose your response differently, how it can even change the outcome of what's happening in that relationship. So you really have a few options. You have one option where you, you just don't respond. You know, sometimes there's people, um, I remember one time I got a really ugly email. I mean, it was ugly, you know, here at the church, um, you know. And, and so I decided I'm not responding. I'm not going to argue this because there's a fool's argument. I was like, we're, we're not going down this road. Sometimes you, you decide then to respond, but you respond carefully. You don't react. You know, it, that first initial words that flow through your head, you're, you can feel your blood pressure rising. You're like, I am going to destroy them with my words, you know, and I'm the God of war, and I'm going to, you know. No, you just take it, and you pray over it, and then you don't re- react to them. You, you respond. You use some wisdom. Um, you, know, you know, if you're texting like this really fast with ugly face, you probably shouldn't hit sin. That's, that'd be my advice. Look in the mirror while you're texting, and if it's like this, stop yourself. Like, just throw it in the toilet and be like, I'm walking away, I'm walking away, right? You, but you, you can respond, but, but you're not going to react. And then sometimes with people, you just listen and grow. Sometimes you have something you need to learn. Maybe you did step over a line. Maybe you did come across the wrong way. And maybe you need to grow in that area in your life. But, but I think for many of us, that we have to learn the difference between a critical voice, and a challenging voice. We need challenging voices in our life. We don't have to yield to the critical, but we need to yield to the challengers. The critical ones tear us down. They're saying something to hurt us, to belittle us, to empower themselves. The challenger sometimes does it to build us up. So so God's going to put you in environments, especially in church world, where there's people that are going to help you grow, and you have to thank God for those. Because if they come with you with a heart, hey, I want to encourage you, I want to help build you, you know, if they come with a heart of humility, that's not a critical voice. If they're praying about you before they talk to you, that's not a critical voice. That's a good, challenging voice. It's part of a godly relationship. Listen to Proverbs 15:31. It says, if you listen to constructive criticism, you'll be at home among the wise. If. If you choose to listen to people that challenge you, you can be home among the wise. If you reject discipline, you only harm yourself. But if you listen to correction, you grow in understanding. The fear of the Lord teaches wisdom, and humility precedes honor. So we have to decide in our heart that the difference and learn that there are good godly voices that challenge us, but we recognize the critical ones and recognize where the source of that is. Romans puts it this way, live in harmony with one another. 
Now, anytime you see unity and harmony in Scripture, there's always humility precedes it. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Don't be conceited. Verse 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Now, he's not talking about being a people pleaser, but what he is saying that in the context of what you're saying, regardless of who it is, a coworker, your mom, your dad, your brother, sister, whoever it is, if there was a, a judge of, of peers around you, would they be able to say, you handled that well, you, kept, you reined it in, you said the right things? Or because sometimes this is what we do with difficult people, we have a different set of rules for our difficult people than we do for everybody else. And so we can be more venomous with them. We can be more derogatory. We can be more critical. We can be more fiery. And what Scripture says is, listen, you have one scale that you balance all your words on, and that is, does it please God? And then you need to be able to, whatever you say, to put it in the daylight and say, would, it, would everybody agree that this was the way to handle it? It goes on to say, verse uh, 18, if at all possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. He says, in the world that we live in today, he says, you're not picking fights. You're not finding faults. You're going to be at peace with everybody that you possibly can. That if there is a way to walk through that conversation with peace, then pick that path. It, because a lot of times we're tempted to pick that path of strife and pick that path of conflict, pick that path that takes a little dig at them while we're walking through. He says, no, no, no. As much as it depends on you, walk in peace. The third thing is this. Um, never retaliate, but live redemptively. Never retaliate, but live redemptively. Now listen to this scripture, 1 Peter 3, 9. Do not repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you, right? Don't go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he'll grant you his blessing. I personally don't like the second part of that verse. It, don't retaliate. Okay, I'll get it. I'll, 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 I'll back off. I'll be like, cool, man. You do you. I'll do me. All right, see you later. You're like, N done, blocked on my phone. Okay, we're over. Like, that's good. We're good. But then he says, pay them back with a blessing. I'm like, I don't want to bless them. I want to karate chop them. Like, I just want to like, yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, like, why bless them? Why bless them? Why, why do I have to, if this person's done this to me, why do I have to not only be nice and not retaliate because I thought about what they said for two days and I said it, and then I thought if they say that again, this is what I'm going to say, and then they'll say this and I'll say this, then they'll crumple and cry like I've already thought it all out, like I already know how it's going to go. He says, no, no, no. He goes, I want you to bless them. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe this is just like a one-off scripture. Maybe, you know, it's one of them things you're just kind of like, eh, it's kind of an idea, but nobody followed up. They did. They did all over the Bible. Romans 12, 19, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it's mine to avenge. I'll repay, says the Lord. So I kind of like that one. I was like, God's going God's to kick some booty for my, on my behalf. Like, he's going to go get them. So I'm feeling better about myself. And then verse 20, rend it. <laughs> on the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, giving something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. In other words, that difficult person has a need. They're saying it for a reason. Try to meet that need. Maybe they don't trust people anymore because they've been hurt. Show that you're a different kind of person. Maybe they're saying it because they've had a really bad day. Scoot past the words and talk to the person. He says, meet that need. He says, and this is it. This is why. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. He says the way that we defeat evil is we don't go evil against evil, not ugly word against ugly word, bitterness against bitterness, rage against rage, anger against anger. He says the way that we overcome evil in this world is the good people do good things to evil people, that we treat them with grace. And the idea here is that maybe this person who's saying these things, doing these things, these difficult people, when they see how kind and merciful you are, it'll lead them to a place of repentance. That, that, that burning coals, in other words, it just gets on them. And you ever been embarrassed? You've done something really stupid. It's just like heat's on you. It's just like, I cannot believe I did that. He says, maybe if you treat them with kindness, it'll lead them to repentance. So it'll take the evil of what they did and turn it to a good thing where they're transformed. That we're not tr returning evil for evil. And that's, a, to me, that's an extreme spiritual discipline to look past the emotional baggage being thrown at you and to really dig into your spirit man and allow your spirit man to take the lead because your emotions won't want to do this. 
Listen to Proverbs 15.1. It says, a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. So when these words come at you, he says, just come back with a soft one. Come back with a gentle one. Because if you go back like, oh, well, you're going to say that? Well, let me tell you something. Then all of a sudden he says, it's going to make the temper. You're going to keep turning the tempers up. But that gentle answer turns it down. And I would even say this. If you're angry at somebody, do not respond. Text message, email, Facebook posts, Instagram direct messages. Just stop until you can talk to them in person or on the phone. Verse 2. The tongue of the wise makes knowledge appealing. The mouth of the fool belches out foolishness. Now, I love this language that they use here. They say the fool just burps it out. It's like what's on the inside of them is just like, it's just an overflow of whatever is happening on the inside of them. And he says, anytime you get into a place where you're just belching out stuff from inside of you, you're just saying stuff, he goes, you're stepping into the shoes of a fool. Verse 3. The Lord is watching everywhere, keeping his eye on both the evil and the good. Gentle words are a tree of life, and a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. So he says, with, with the harsh words, bring gentle words, because those words are a tree of life. Those words can bring fruit, bring peace, bring life in those situations. Because what happens so many times in our life is that we've been hurt. And there's people in this room today that, that a good part of what's going on on the inside of you, some of your struggle, is the people that have said and done things to you in the past. And we all know that what difficult people can do in our lives, we've all been shaped by those. There's things that, that we've all had to outlive and words that have hung in our head that we're still trying to outrun that maybe somebody told us when we were a child or we were young where somebody said something to you that just hurt so deeply, it's, it's like it's stuck in your soul and your mind. And some of us have spent a lot of time trying to outrun those words, but those words and those feelings are still hanging around even in church today. You've prayed and you've read the Bible. But what I'm believing today is that God's going to set some people free from the power of those words. Because the fourth thing that Scripture tells us to do is something that that we see in Ephesians 4.32, and it's also throughout Scripture. It says, Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. The illustration of the level of forgiveness is he said a a price had to be paid, so Jesus paid the price so that through Christ God could forgive us. He said without Christ taking the punishment for us, we couldn't be forgiven. And so what you decide to be a forgiver, to be somebody with the difficult people, is you decide the price has been paid because of what Christ has done so I can forgive them and I can release them so that I can be free. Me and Stephen lead a men's freedom small group this semester. And one of the illustrations in this small group, they talked about forgiveness. They said unforgiveness is like setting yourself on fire, hoping the other person dies of smoke inhalation. You're killing yourself in hope of punishing them. And as as the band's about to come and just begin to play, um, we're going to worship together. And as we worship here today, what I want to remind you of and what I really felt in my heart is that God wants to set some people free today. You've had some pain that, that's affected you, and you say, well, I'm going to walk out of here and deal with it. Why don't you, this morning, in just a couple minutes, come to the altar and lay it down at Jesus' feet. and Let somebody pray with you. And pray that God begins that healing process in your life. Because my fourth point is this. You've got to release them. You've got to let it go. You're not hurting them. You're hurting you. You're not tying them up. You're tying yourself up. Let me pray for for all of us real quick.